So, if you, who has been here every week so far this year? Awesome, awesome. So, if you guys remember, I challenged you guys to commit for eight weeks. This is an eight-week series um, called Rhythm. And if you haven't been with us, this whole series, we are diving into the rhythms of our life and also the rhythms and the practices that Jesus did, okay? Remember, we said we all have rhythms, right? We all are doing these things. We all have patterns. We don't just wake up one day, right, and be like, oh, I planned to end up like this, right? A lot of times we, I don't know, I can just speak from my example. Sometimes, uh, man, I would love to be in better shape. All of this is my fault, right? We don't just wake up one day or decide, man, I want to be lazy in all the things. So our practices and our rhythms, believe it or not, whether good or bad, has put us where we currently are, right? There are rhythms that culture wants us to do. Do what you want to do. You just worry about you. You can be whatever you want to be, all those things. But what did God say? What were Jesus's rhythms and practices, right? We want to be able, just like what Diana said, we want to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. And the only way to be able to do that is to what? Look at what Jesus did. Last week, we talked about prayer and fasting, um, and we ended the weekend with an amazing night. I know some of you guys, I was able to pray for you guys. Our church had a 24-hour prayer experience. Legit, there were people here for 24 hours, Friday from 6 p.m. all the way to Saturday. Some of you came in. I was able to pray with you guys, and that rolled over to the weekend on Sunday. Uh, man, it was so incredible. I saw friends restoring relationships, families restoring. I saw people that I haven't seen in a while come back to church. It was an amazing weekend, and it rolled over to our worship night. Man, it was so good. If you missed it, you missed you missed it. Uh, but I'm sure we will have some more. But we said this last week, right? We said we often overfeed ourselves physically, and we malnourish ourselves spiritually. And we asked ourselves, how do we remain hungry for the presence of Jesus? And if, you, if this is your first time and you're like, hey, I, I, I want to know what he's talking about, all of, or if you've missed a couple of weeks, all of our messages are on YouTube. Generation Youth, you can go back and re-watch all of these messages. But tonight, we're going to be diving into a really cool story that as I was studying for this, when I, I grew up in church, there was a lot of things that I learned, but now I'm like, okay, there's actually more into that once we start unpacking it. I'm super, super excited about the story that we're going to dive into tonight because we're talking about community and why do we need community? Who needs you, right? Who needs you and who do you need, okay? So, but before we dive into that, um, I have to ask this question. Why do we need each other and why do others need me? Write that down. Why do we need each other and why do others need me? I'm going to tell you a story. So, back uh, when I was in middle school, I believe it was, I had a dirt bike. All right, I was Kawasaki Kyle before Kyle started drinking rock stars and all those things. I was, I was had all the Fox racing stuff, right? And uh, I had a Kawasaki, green, I had a helmet, all the gear, the thing. I thought I was going to be the next Travis Pastrana. But guess what? I wasn't. I uh, turned out to be a youth pastor. So if you want to be a youth pastor, get a dirt bike. All right, I also tried skateboarding one time, broke my elbow. That didn't work out. Again, became a youth pastor. If you want to break yourself, you'll become a youth pastor one day and have stories. But anyway, I was riding my dirt bike. And uh, again, I thought it was cool. I had all the stuff, right? But I wasn't really cool. Every time I try to be cool, I end up injuring myself, all right? So don't try to be cool. So what I was doing, me and my cousin, he had a four-wheeler. I had a dirt bike. Man, I was about to go. I was like, look, there's this tree. I'm about to zip around this thing real quick. It was muddy outside. I'm about to sling dirt everywhere. It's going to be awesome. That's what you do with a dirt bike. You sling dirt, right? Some of y'all, maybe. Anybody have a dirt bike? Or am I just, just me? Jason, you got a dirt bike? Okay, so you know, I'm going to talk to you. You know. You know, I thought I was going to be cool. I thought I was going to whip that thing around. Guess what? I didn't. And I uh, ended up rolling the dirt bike over. It all happened so fast. It all happened so fast. I sat there and I got up. I was like, okay, I think I'm good. I looked down and I have a hole in my leg. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you can ask my wife. I have a scar right here. Uh, and oddly enough, I don't know why, but like when the weather's weird, my leg hurts right there. I don't know why. But I looked up, I have a hole, in, and I'm not trying to be tough or anything, but it just happened so quickly, I didn't realize it. 
And sure enough, I look down, and there's like a hole in my leg like that deep. And if you ride dirt bikes, and if you're familiar with dirt bikes, you know what a foot peg is. Yeah, you know what that is. Nice, but yeah, it's got spikes on it for your feet to stay planted on it. Yeah, that went in my leg. Okay? Yeah, ow. So after I looked at it, I'm like, duh, okay, I have a hole in my leg. I just fell on the ground. Okay? I just fell on the ground. I tried to walk, but I'm like, "Ah, I I don't know what to do. Okay? But this is what's cool. My uncle, my cousin, he's like, hey. His dad came over. He's my uncle. He, this is what he did. He looked at my leg, and guess what? He picked me up, and he carried me. I want to stay right there. He carried me, and I'll tell you why, to the house. All right, this is what's really cool. I don't know why he had all this medical equipment. He works in construction, so I guess it makes sense. But he wrapped my leg up. We're like, look, I'm going to get this thing bandaged up. You need to go to the emergency room. And sure enough, I had to get stitches inside of my leg because it was so deep. And then on the outside of my leg, it was terrible. I'd never seen the inside of somebody's leg. And I, there was like bone and all. It was, it was deep, y'all. But I'm grateful for my uncle because if we're being honest, has anybody ever been in a bad situation before? Okay. Have you ever been in a bad situation before alone by yourself? Remember we talked about last week, what did we talk about? The wilderness, right? And we talked about there are two types of temptation. There are public temptations and there's private temptations, right? What do we do in the time of wilderness? What do we do in our quiet time, right? We talked about Jesus. He spent a lot of time with people, but he also spent a lot of time alone, an intentional time alone with just him and God. So I'm grateful for my uncle. This is what's really, really cool. Um, C.S. Lewis said this. He says, deep community is not the goal of it, Uh, a goal a church seeks, but the result of people living for something greater than themselves. That's so good. I'm going to repeat that. Deep community, not surface level community, but deep community is not the goal of a church that what a church seeks, but the result of people living for something greater than themselves. Deep community. And we're going to talk about community tonight. We've been in Matthew a lot, but tonight we're going to be in the book of Mark. It's right after Matthew. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 2. Now, this story is really, really cool because I'll go ahead and just give it away. In this story, Jesus actually heals a paralyzed man, okay? And growing up while I was in church, man, this was so awesome, celebrating Jesus' miracle and this man who couldn't walk and this whole story that happened, his friends bringing him to the feet of Jesus, and Jesus healed him, and man, he can walk, celebrate, go on, for your, go on with his life. How cool, right? How cool of a miracle. But if I'm being honest, growing up, that's where it stopped for me. And in this story, and what we're going to unpack tonight, I'm hoping that you guys see a, a different perspective on what deep community can do. Are you guys ready? None of you. Awesome. I'm ready, so I'm going to start talking. Mark chapter 2. Tough crowd, man. Verse 1, maybe the online will be be better. I don't know. Here we go. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, this is what it says. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Verse 4, they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, Your sins are forgiven. Check this out. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. This is interesting. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, not what they said. He knew what they were thinking. So he asked them. They got called out by Jesus. Some of y'all don't like like getting called out by me, but this is Jesus calling out people, right? I'm just trying to follow the ways of Jesus. That's it. Just kidding. Uh, This is what I said. Is it easier, or why do you ask the question, 
in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Now, I think verse 9 is an entire sermon on itself, but we're not diving into that tonight. Verse 10, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man, what did he do? Jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. We've never seen anything like this before. Now, if you didn't catch this, I want to ask you this question. Who's your for? Who's your for? Now, I want to just make sure we're clear on the scene here, okay? Can you just get a real quick, get a visual in your mind of where you live, whether it's a house, apartment, wherever you live? Who you live with, like I, I'm thinking of my living room right now. My, my living room and kitchen, it's, it's open. We have bedrooms on each side. I'm envisioning my house. Now, the scripture said this. Imagine, we'll just use my house and me for an example. Jesus comes back in town. And he's like, Tyler, I'm going to hang out with y'all for a little bit. I know the Chan don't sleep, but I, I can do miracles, all the things, right? <sighs> That's funny to me. Tough crowd tonight. Y'all good? Everybody awake? Middle section, y'all awake? Yeah. All right. Tell you, they awake? Okay. We good? Left side, strong side. We okay over here? Woo. Mickey is. I'll go balls. Okay. Anyway, so now that we're all awake. So can you imagine your house being so crowded because that's where Jesus was that you couldn't get in your house? Okay? It was so crowded, you couldn't even get through the door. All right? Can you picture your house being just this crowded? So much so that people wanted to be in the presence of Jesus so bad that they did whatever it took to be in his presence. Okay? You guys following here. So, check this out. How desperate are you to be or are you to be in the presence of Jesus? And better yet, how desperate are you to get your community into the presence of Jesus? Now, this story and these five men, it spoke volumes to me. I never looked at this story this way. This paralyzed man, his community, the people that he had around him, cared about him so much, they were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend some help. They were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend into the presence of Jesus. Now, can you imagine, right, Jesus is at your house, he's hanging out, it's crowded, all the things. Can you imagine you're hanging out with Jesus, and all of a sudden, somebody's cutting a hole in your roof? Can you just imagine that real quick, right? That's crazy. That is insane. And not only now, let's just picture here, right here, let's say a hole, and now all of a sudden a man, he's just starting, like, what in the world, right? Who's fixing this junk, right? Brand new house. I don't know if they had clay houses. I don't know what their house was. But regardless, there's now a hole in the roof. And can you just imagine that? Can you just imagine that real quick? Although Jesus frequently sought out times of solitude and prayer, much of his ministry took place in the context of community. Right? We talked about solitude last week and silence, the wilderness. And although Jesus did that to spend time with his father, God, he all oftentimes spent a lot of time with people. Jesus himself had community. Check this out. You can't lead people to a place that you've never been. I think a lot of times we often, especially us Christians, uh, we talk about, man, you should, you should go there. Man, God really moved at that church this weekend. I heard about all the things. Man, uh, I heard that, uh, man, that this person, man, he got delivered from this sin that he was struggling with. Man, that, that's, that's, that's a good God, isn't it? It's like we, we, can, we can talk about all the things, and we could want the best for other people, but can I remind you something? The same God who heals your friend, restores that friendship, all of those things, guess what? He is your God, too. He is your God, too. But guess what? We can talk the talk, but if we don't walk the walk, like Jesus did, what does it matter? 
right? We can, maybe we're smart enough, we can say all the things, we can do all the things, but if you personally are not having a deep rooted relationship with Jesus, then man, it's like, I think about it as a father. If my kids, let's just say my kids, right? I have three kids. I'm a husband. I know my wife, Lindsay. Okay. Gunner, are you good? All right. I'm a husband. I have a wonderful wife. I have three kids. If I was just worried about myself and I was just worried about my relationship with Jesus, and let's say I made it to heaven, but my family got neglected because of it. I don't think that's, that's not good, right? I make it, but I never, I never shared with my kids or my wife what God has done and what God can do, right? We're called to share. That's what's called a testimony. We saw Jace's video. Man, he shared his testimony, right? We're not supposed to hoard what God has done in our life. We talk about it a lot as leaders. Like you get things and you pass it down. Guess what? There's actually a story in the Bible where the gospel stopped with a generation. A generation behind them never heard about it because why? They stopped talking about it. And guess what I don't want? I don't want that to happen. I want you guys to share your faith. This is really, really cool. I did some math. Um, Not a lot of numbers. I'm not very good at math. But I did some math. And guess what? There are over 2,000 students between our two middle schools and our high school. Okay? 2,000. Typically, I know this is a weird weekend or weird Wednesday. Typically, we typically have 150 kids here, okay? Remember, there's 2,000 in our community, okay? So check this out. I know a lot of people don't go to church, okay? I know we have churches on every corner, it seems like. But let's just say, for just numbers sake, for easy math for your boy, all right? I went to college for one year and then didn't do too well. For easy math, let's just say 400. 400 students in our community, they're plugged into it. I'm talking about actively plugged in. They don't just show up on Christmas or Easter or once every three months. I'm talking about two to three times a month, they are involved in a church. Let's just say it's 400. Okay, 400 out of 2,000, guess what? There are 1,600 students, what? They don't have a home church. I know there's a church on every corner here in this town. But... I hear it all the time. We don't have a student ministry. We don't have a student pastor. We don't have this. All we have is this. All these things, and it's so sad, and it breaks my heart. What we get to be a part of here is so special. But our town, in our context, could you imagine the impact you can have if you shared your faith with just one person? Can you imagine? You ever thrown a rock into a pond? What's it do? Somebody said a ripple. Do you know what kind of ripple effect you can have by just sharing your testimony or your faith with one person, right? We saw it last week in the video, the guy on ESPN who prayed for Damar. you, You saw what happens when a community of believers step out in faith and pray, right? The whole nation was praying. And we talked about what if that was normal, man? Hey, before we start this game, we're going to pray on live TV. But guess what? It starts with small acts of obedience. So there's, let's just say there's 1,600, right? It's more than just praying for it to happen. You know what you have to do? We talked about it. You have to move. You have to make room for it to happen. Check this out. I want to ask you this question. Are you willing to carry them? Are you willing to carry them? Because if we're being honest tonight, somebody carried you here. Somebody, whatever that looked like, right, whether it was invite here, whether your parents made you come here, I don't know. But somebody along your life brought you here. They carried you here. And I find it just so ironic that this paralyzed man Now, I don't know how big these people were back there, but back then, but like, I'm 6'1 and none your business pounds, okay? (laughs) If if I'm carrying somebody, it's probably going to suck after a little bit, right? But these people wanted their friend so bad to be in the presence of Jesus, they were willing to, one, carry him there, and two, cut a hole 
in some random person's house to lower him down so he could be healed by Jesus. Are you willing to be that brave? What are you willing to do, number one, to get you? I thought it was such an ironic time, you know? I don't like to get on tangents. However, I'm about to get on one. Check this out. We are willing to do whatever it takes from time to time to make sure we're at that football game. You know what my parents did? Growing up, my parents, legit, I didn't even play. It was like my freshman year. Sitting on the sidelines. What are they doing? Sitting up in the stands in the rain to watch me ride the bench in the rain. But when it comes to church, uh, sometimes we're just, I don't know. I don't think I can make it. But, uh, hey, cool thing. I got to, I was up till 2 o'clock whatever, playing video games, it's priorities, okay? That's why I'm not uh, anti-sports or any of those things, but sometimes we prioritize the wrong things, and we're willing to make room and adjust our schedules so we can do this or go to that game or whatever, but we're not willing from time to time to make room and to adjust our schedules or do whatever it takes, number one, for you to be in the presence of Jesus, and number two, invite others into the presence of Jesus. These people cut a hole in somebody's house, That's crazy. If somebody cuts a hole in my roof, I'm probably going to go off on somebody, right? But they were willing to do whatever, willing to do whatever. Could you imagine these people, though, like this mug just floating down, they just lowering them down? I thought it was so cool. Not only do we need people, but people need us. Why? Somebody carried you here. So who are you going to carry? And guess what? It doesn't just have to happen on Wednesdays. It can happen in your hallway. I love being able to go to Portland West FCA and see that hallway full of students. It's awesome. It's so cool. It's so cool. But it can start there. It can start by like, hey, we're going to get to school five minutes early in our class, three or four. We're just going to get together. We're going to pray. We're going to pray over our teacher. I might not like her. You may kind of maybe not stand her. But guess what? I'm going to pray for her. I'm going to pray for her. It can start with those small acts of obedience. I love what Philippians 2 Three through four says this. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. I just thought that was so good. and such a good reminder. And here are six things real quick that I believe that if we start to practice, right, we talked about a couple weeks ago, it's not the practices that change you, right? The practices open up pathways for you to hear God, right? Doing the thing might not make any difference if our heart is in the wrong posture, right? Anybody can do things, but when our heart is synced up with God's heart, man, he can do some awesome things. So here are just six things that you can try, maybe tonight. Number one, love God. Love God. I don't know how anybody can love others if they don't love God first, because God is love. Number two, love others. It's equally important. The Bible talks about love your neighbor as yourself. And maybe some of us tonight, maybe we need to do some self-evaluating. Do you love yourself or do you not like yourself? Can I remind you that you were created in the image of God and God makes no mistakes? He makes no mistakes. So when we start saying things about ourselves that aren't nice or whatever, you're actually telling God, hey, you messed up. And guess what? God's perfect. He makes no mistakes. We need to love others. When number three, we need to work hard, right? The scriptures talked about not being lazy. We don't need to pretend. We need to be patient. That one can be hard, right? And just like these four men did with this paralyzed man, Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. But see, I'm hoping tonight that you guys, your minds got opened up about this story because my mind got opened up about it at age 29. Yes, we need to celebrate the miracle that Jesus did. And yes, this man got up and he walked right out of that thing. How stinking cool. But what if these four men were like, hey, bro, I'm busy. Hey, you're going to have to carry yourself. What if? What if? What if we are too busy to put our people 
and our community into the presence of Jesus. Are we too busy? Are we too busy filling our schedules with all this stuff, right? And we just forget to make room for Jesus. The song was so timely. What if? Don't be too busy to, one, get yourself in the presence of Jesus, and two, bring others along with you. Do whatever it takes, even if you have to cut a hole into somebody's roof, right? Do whatever it takes. Say that with me. Do whatever it takes. Say it. Hey, say it like you mean it. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. But I'm going to ask it again. Who's your four? Who is your four? I want to go back and read our opening text just as we close. Romans 12, 9 through 13. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Don't be fake. And take delight in honoring each other. Don't be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Romans 12, 9 through 13.